What is up everyone? In this video, I wanna tell you how I got eight CVEs in two weeks of research and wanna share with you really practical steps on how you can get started with CVE hunting today. Specifically, here are the things we are going to cover. First, we'll talk about what exactly is a CVE. Second, we'll talk about an overview of the eight CVEs that I found kind of walking you through that process. Third, I will give you some advice on how you can identify some eligible CVE targets. Fourth, we'll say, hey, what do you do when you find a vulnerability that might qualify for a CVE, what are the clear next steps you should take? And then finally, I'll share with you some learning resources that I recommend so you can get started on this journey today. So first, what the heck is a CVE? Now, when I was first getting into pen testing, I always pictured CVEs as this like goal that I had, but I would never get to. I always pictured CVEs in order to get one, you need to be this like super elite hacker who can reverse engineer binaries and look at zero days in Microsoft and get like unauthenticated RCE through some crazy SQL injection, but it's not that hard. Seriously, CVEs are not out of reach for you. They're not out of reach for me. Uh, CVE is really just an identifier of a vulnerability often in an open source project. The vulnerability can be something as simple as cross-site scripting, denial of service, which many applications are vulnerable to that if you spend just a little bit of time digging into them. So that is what a CVE is. So the first thing I want you to recognize is not outside of your reach. If I can get one, you can get one and they really do add a lot of stuff to your resume. So you can imagine you're applying for your first pen testing job and you and another person are applying for the same job but in your resume, you have three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight CVEs. Your resume is definitely gonna stand out because you have CVEs assigned to you and they can be looked up in the database and that so shows your name as the researcher and you have a public disclosure showing the entire process. So CVEs, I would argue, are better for your career than the OSCP, the PMPT, and any other certifications you can get. Those are good, I have some of them, but once again, CVE is real world experience and it doesn't cost you anything to get and it makes your resume look super good if you're trying to break into the field or if you're in the field and just trying to move up in your career. And let me share with you kind of a glimpse of the ones I found in order to set the context. I spent two weeks researching something called Silver Peas Core. Now, Silver Peas is an intranet used by organizations and government agencies to share information with employees, to share files, and I was able to access it on Docker Hub, which we'll talk about it in a little bit, and was able to spin up a local instance of it rather easily. Once I spun it up, I literally just treated it like a web app pen test, which that's one core skill, and we'll talk about that later as well, is you need a somewhat strong knowledge of web apps and web app pen testing as you dig into some of these projects, but I literally just treated it like I treat a web app pen test that I do all the time. And as I was doing that, I found eight different things. So I found broken access control leading to denial of service. I found one that allows an attacker to access support the deployer. I found CS CSRF leading to privilege escalation. I found one that allows you to read all messages. I found stored cross-site scripting in a messaging feature. So you send a message to someone, JavaScript triggers. I found broken access control on the bin. I found more CSRF, more broken access control. Once again, in just two weeks, I'll post this blog in the description of the video, but here's the one I outlined in the blog. I wanted to show how something that often is overlooked, which is cross-site scripting, can be used to fully compromise an application. And so this is the CVE that I outlined in this blog post. When you log into SilverPeas, you see an area to write to administrators. So I thought, hmm, I wonder if I could execute JavaScript when an administrator reads my message. I first tried to do your simple script alert script, <clears throat> did not work, it caught me. But then I tried this, which is a super common way to bypass. You can see this on payload all the things, image source on error prompt nine. I sent that message to the administrator, logged into the Z administrator because it's running locally on my machine and the JavaScript executed. So that in and of itself, that qualifies for stored cross-site scripting. And actually, if you look at the CVE, that is the POC right there, just showing that JavaScript execution is possible. But I wanted to take it to the next level. And because I had access to the entire administrative framework, I could study what does it look like when an admin makes another user an admin and how can I do that myself using JavaScript? Because if I can figure that out, then I can do a cross-site scripting payload that when the admin opens it, I become the admin. 
And that's what I did. I eventually came up with this payload. I walked through how to do it here. Essentially, you send this over to an admin. As soon as the admin opens this message, you become the administrator. Now, built into SilverPiece is something called the Silver Crawler. Silver Crawler is like a way for the admins to host files for employees to access. So Silver Crawler runs as the root user on the backend Linux server. And when you set up Silver Crawler, you can literally set the root directory as root. And then when you open up Silver Crawler, you have full access to the underlying file system as a root user. You can hunt for passwords. You can look at Docker environmental variables. You can go credential hunting in that way. What I did as a POC is I read Etsy password, something that you often see in POCs and demonstrated how I use cross-site scripting to elevate my privileges and eventually get full file read on the back end server showcasing and weaponizing the cross-site scripting impact. So that's what I did, but once again, this is one of the first few projects I even attempted this on, and I guarantee you there are more things out there. So how, how do you identify a target? I don't know how everyone else does, uh, who are probably smarter than me, but let me share with you how I identified a target. There was three things I had in mind. One is I wanted it to be open source. And here's the difference between like a bug bounty and a CVE. On a bug bounty, you're often hacking a private website and reporting vulnerabilities to their team or to hacker one. That's not open source. That does not qualify you for a CVE unless you find like a exploit in some open source framework being used by the website's backend or something like that. But generally speaking, a bug bounty program is not the same as CVEs because it's privately owned. So I wanted to find a project that was open source that I could spin up locally so I'm not breaking any laws as I'm trying to hack it. The next thing is I wanted to see a project that was actively maintained. So if the project was last updated eight years ago, probably not a good target because if you report anything to the vendor, they're not gonna reply to you because knock knock, no one is there. So open source, actively maintained. And for me, I wanted to find a project that had at least one prior CVE because then I knew the development team at least understood the CVE process and all three of those things were true about SilverPeas. Now, the way I found SilverPeas is I used something I shared before called Docker Hub. Now, Docker Hub is a website that hosts a bunch of different Docker containers and it's really easy to spin them up. Usually the maintainers give you very clear instructions on how you can spin up a local instance of that container on your computer. Now there's <clears throat> blog systems, there's CMSs, there's intranets, there's social media websites. There's all kinds of targets there that would qualify for CVEs. So I went on Docker Hub and I just scrolled through Docker Hub. I scrolled through some of the official projects and I found a project called Silverpiece with over 1 million downloads. I clicked on that project. I figured out how I could launch it locally. It took me, I kid you not, about five minutes to get Silverpiece running locally on my machine. And then I just began poking around, figuring out like, how can I hack this? For those of you who do try hack me and hack the box, truly treat it like a CTF. Use your CTF skills find a target. So I don't know if any of you use Vaughn Hub in the past. Uh, Vaughn Hub is still around. Vaughn Hub is a place where you can upload vulnerable servers, vulnerable machines. You can download them. And it was kind of like the try hack me and hack the box, but it's not cloud hosted. You download it locally to your computer, spin it up and you have targets to attack. In many ways, Docker Hub can be like Vaughn Hub. You identify a target you want to attack, you get it spun up locally on your machine, and then you hack away, you do research, you dig into stuff, and you will find a vulnerability. If you do that for enough time on enough different projects, you will find a vulnerability. But when you find something, let's say you find cross-site scripting, let's say you find CSRF, let's say you find SQL injection, whatever it is, what do you do next? Well, when you find a vulnerability, there's not really hard rules in place besides, you know, don't disclose it on Twitter or X or whatever the heck it's called and tell everybody, hey, here's how you exploit this application. But here's what I did. The first thing I did is I reached out to the vendor. So I reached out to SilverPiece directly in an email message and just told them, hey, I found a vulnerability in SilverPiece core and would like to know if there's a secure channel to report this to your team. And what SilverPiece did is they added me to a private uh, security issue tracker on the SilverPiece side of things. And I submitted full details with PLCs of each vulnerability that I found. And I even took it a step further and I made video walkthroughs. So I wrote written POCs and I made them video walkthroughs guiding them through what I did and maybe some suggested ways on how they can fix it and submitted that to their team. Uh, just a few days, days later, they got back to me. They thanked me for the submission. And then I asked them, hey, are you okay with me publicly disclosing this via a CVE? And they told me, hey, actually we would prefer that you wait just a few weeks because we're patching all of this right now. It will be available in our next patch, which is Silverpiece 6.3.2. So they told me once 6.3.2 is released, you can go ahead and release those publicly. 
So during that time, here is exactly what I did. I will guide you guys through the process. I went to MITRE's website, cveform.mitre.org, and on here, you can submit and request a CVE ID. I'll guide you through this process. We can even pretend to submit one of the ones I found, but this is truly what I did. I went here, I select a request type. I found, I wanted to report a vulnerability. I put in my email address, number of vulnerabilities, and that was eight. And here's the first one, cross-site scripting. So you can pick from these. So you kind of have to figure out how it fits in there, but we'll do cross-site scripting. The vendor of course was Silverpiece. The product was Silverpiece Core 6.3.1 and then has vendor confirmed or acknowledged the vulnerability. So even if they ignore you, uh, you can still go through MITRE and MITRE will attempt to work with the vendor. For me, it was yes, they acknowledge it. They were actually pushing the fix to GitHub. You can do the attack type here. Of course, cross-site scripting would be remote. And the execution here is escalation of privileges. And then we want to know the affected components. And I'll just show you how I did the affected components. So we can go back up to my POC details up here. If we go over to the stored cross-site scripting and the messaging feature, here's the official like disclosure right here, but it's the notification and messaging feature. You can see that right there. And that's of course how you send messages. So the notification slash messaging feature, if I can type, built into the application. Cannot type. What are the methods of exploitation? Example, to exploit, someone must open a crafted JPEG file. Well, you can see that to exploit this vulnerability, uh, you do that. So I actually had that in my original submission and just copy and pasted it surely to the disclosure, but that's how you exploit the vulnerability. Suggested description of the vulnerability for use in the CVE. I think for this one, it would be this right here, kind of a one sentence description of the vulnerability. Discover, right, this is Tyler Ramsby with Rhino Security Labs, and then references. This would be, you wouldn't have much here. And here's the confusing part. So here it would be to be released. Any additional information you wanna share with them. What I did is I went through all this for all eight CVEs and I hit submit. It took about one week, so about five work days, and then MITRE got back to me. They reviewed my submission, and they gave me all the CVE numbers, but they were in what's called a reserved status. When the CVEs are in a reserved status, it means they're not yet publicly disclosed, but I have the CVE numbers reserved, I know what they are. At that time, I worked with Silverpiece and once 6.3.2 was released, I came out with my blog post, I pushed all the changes to GitHub so they were publicly disclosed, and then they were still reserved. I went back to MITRE, and on the second attempt, here's what I did. Notify CVE about a publication, and then it asks you very similar questions. Number of vulnerabilities reported, IDs requested, and then I just filled out the information again, saying here are the CVEs that were assigned to me, here's how I reported them, here are all the GitHub links, here is the blog post link, but it is now public disclosure. MITRE, once they receive notification of public disclosure, they then public publish it in their database, and then it gets replicated to all the different CVE databases. So you can look at my CVEs now, most of them are medium, some of them are high severity, I think the highest one is like eight, Point eight, if my memory serves me correct, but some low, some medium, some high among the eight CVEs, but that is the process. You do the same thing, you submit the CVE, it gets reserved status, go back to the same page, then you select notify, right here, notify CVE about a publication, and then you share the information on where you disclose that with the, or, or with the organization, with the public, and then CVE will, or MITRE will replicate that for you. And then you have your official CVEs assigned to you. So once again, not an overly difficult process, but the most difficult part about finding CVEs is knowing what to look for. Now, I know many of you are trying to break into the field. You might be thinking to yourself, Tyler, that's great, but you're, oh, you're a pen tester. Like you do this for a living. How can I do it? Well, one resource I would recommend, try Hack Me is really good, but if you're looking for CVEs and web apps in particular, I cannot recommend the Bug Bounty Path on Hack the Box Academy enough. Now, Hack the Box is not sponsoring this video in any way. I'm not making any money from talking about them. I will say, yo, Hack the Box, if you do want to give me some money, you can happily sponsor one of my videos, but the Bug Bounty Hunter Path on Hack the Box is incredible. I'm about 70% of the way through that path and about 90% of the way through the pen testing path on Hack the Box Academy, but all of their resources 
are really good and very much real world. So here is a practical way I would encourage you to do this. When you work through a module on Hack the Box Academy, let's take cross-site scripting for an example. When you work through the module on cross-site scripting, you learn how it works, you learn how to bypass some restrictions, how to execute it, how it can be used, how it can be weaponized. Once you do that, go to Docker Hub and find a project that is open source, that is actively maintained, that has at least one other CVE, spin it up locally and have that be your capstone, have that be your CTF target and take what you learned in that module and just say, hey, can I exploit it? Can I hack stuff based on what I learned? Can I hack this open source project? And when you do, when you do get that vulnerability, then follow those steps. First, reach out to the vendor, and then hopefully they get back to you. Silverpiece got back to me pretty quickly. Reach out to the vendor, then reach out to MITRE, get those CVEs reserved, work with the vendor on public disclosure, and then publicly disclose and then tell MITRE, hey, I have disclosed all the details for this and you will get those CVs officially assigned to your name, added to your resume, and it will be an incredible way, not just to break into the field, but to help the field at large. The more vulnerabilities that you find in a report in an ethical manner, the less vulnerabilities the real bad actors are able to exploit. So as we do this, it is fun, but we really are making the world a better place. It's a little bit cliche to say that, but it is true. So that is my CVE hunting journey. I hope you found this helpful. And hey, if you have questions about something I shared, maybe something was unclear, let me know in the comment. Would love to hear from you and I will do my best to interact with each comment and help you along your way. So happy hacking, happy CVE hunting. I will see y'all in the next one.